Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge in the UK. I'm Dr. Rhys Grant and I am the Science Communication Specialist here in the Biochemistry Department, shared also with the Cell and Molecular Biology Programme at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre at Cambridge University. So I'm extremely pleased to welcome you to our department on this beautifully sunny Tuesday afternoon for this live talk as part of the 2021 Cambridge Festival, which aims to bring the research of the University of Cambridge directly to you wherever you are in the world. So for this talk, I am joined by Professor Catherine Lilly, who is Professor of Cellular Dynamics at the University of Cambridge. And today, Catherine's going to be speaking to us about how mass spectrometers, which are essentially just sophisticated weighing scales, can be used in various research fields, ranging from tackling disease to helping us learn about ancient civilizations. I'm also joined, as always, by Latika Sagumba, who is part of our department's secretariat team. And Latika is going to be helping me out today behind the scenes with running this online event. But before we get on to any of our science or mass spectrometry, the first thing I'd like to ask you all to please do is click the subscribe button down below to follow our YouTube channel, because we have loads more talks coming up this week for the Cambridge Festival, and we're also planning to bring you more live content direct from our department in the near future. I'd also encourage you all to please go and check out our other social media channels after Catherine's talk, obviously on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on, using our handle at CAMBIOCHEM. So that's C-A-M-B-I-O-C-H-E-M, because we use these channels to tell you about all of the news, the research, the teaching, events, outreach, everything really that goes on in our departments. I'd also just like to mention that after Catherine's talk, Catherine Latika and myself will be taking part in a live question and answer session. If you have any, talk, uh, any questions, sorry, on Catherine's talk, or perhaps if you'd like to ask something more general, maybe about the Cambridge Centre for Proteomics, if you could post your questions in the live chat on YouTube, and then the three of us will stay for about 15 to 20 minutes after Catherine's talk to answer as many of your questions as we can get through. If you do choose to participate in the Q&A session, you don't need to worry about being seen or heard because it's just going to be me reading your questions out anonymously on your behalf. So, as I've mentioned, this afternoon's talk is going to be given by Professor Catherine Lilly. So Catherine received both her Bachelor of Science degree and her PhD in biochemistry from the University of Sheffield in the UK. Catherine was then a laboratory manager at the University of Leicester for 11 years before she came back to Cambridge in the year 2000 to establish the Cambridge Centre for Proteomics. Catherine became Professor of Cellular Dynamics at the University of Cambridge in 2012, and she currently directs a research programme that aims to create technology to measure how proteins change position inside cells in response to cell damage and disease. Catherine is a recipient of a Wellcome Trust Investigator Award and is also a partner in Epic XS, funded as part of the Horizon 2020 Work Programme to develop and provide proteomics technologies across Europe. Catherine has published over 250 peer-reviewed papers and in 2018, Catherine received the Human Proteome Organization's Distinguished Achievements in Proteomics Award. More recently, in July 2020, Catherine was elected as a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, or EMBO. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Catherine to begin this afternoon's session. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Rhys. Hello, everybody. As Rhys said, I'm Catherine Lilly, and it gives me great pleasure today to explain to you what proteins are, how uh, we measure them, and importantly, why we weigh them. I'll also tell you about some cool biology that we've learned through our ability to be able to weigh proteins. But first, a little about me. Rhys has done a very good job explaining who I am. Um, I'm also the director of the Cambridge Centre for Proteomics, and I lead um, a very talented team of people whose interests are in protein and in RNA, and I'm going to explain what both of these are later, and particularly where we can find these molecules uh, in cells. So firstly, proteins. 
Proteins are very important components of all living creatures, from uh, tiny viruses, and what I have on the left here is uh, the virus we all know about, uh, SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus, uh, all the way to uh, large elephants. And proteins are present in every cell and tissue of our bodies, but also in biofluids such as blood and urine and saliva and tears. And we use them, or rather we study them, using a variety of different methods and approaches. But the one I'm going to talk to you today about is proteomics. So proteomics may be a word that you've not come across before. But what proteomics is, is a field of uh, biological research where we study the proteome. What the proteome is, is all the proteins that are present in a sample. Now that sample can be many, many different things. It could be a set of cells that we, we get from biological tissue. So what I show here on, on the left is a Chinese hamster ovary cell. This is an electron micrograph, which was captured by one of my very, very talented PhD students, Owen Venard. So if we look at what proteins are present in these cells, that would be the proteome of one of these ovary cells. The sample also could be a biopsy from an organ. We may have a liver biopsy from a patient, and all the proteins within that sample would represent the proteome of liver. Maybe we work on whole organisms. The picture I have here is of Drosophila, more commonly known as a fruit fly. And if we extract all the proteins from a Drosophila, then that is the Drosophila proteome. But our sample could be a blood sample. It could be tears. It could be saliva. It could be urine. Or it could be one of the more exotic samples that my lab has had to process over the years, including extracting proteins from marmite and producing the marmite proteome, all the way to dung beetle poo. And I'm not kidding, we were given an, a sample of dung beetle poo and asked to identify all the different proteins that were present in that sample. So proteomics is where we want to know what proteins are present in a biological sample and what amount of each protein there is. And from this, we can find out all sorts of interesting things. We could use this information to work out the cause of disease, if medical treatments are working, which patients uh, with COVID-19 are more likely than others to develop severe symptoms, which varieties of crops are resistant to drought, or even what ancient civilizations ate. And towards the end of my talk today, I will give you examples of the latter three. So I'll talk about uh, our COVID-19 work, also other people's work on resistance to drought in uh, crops, and also end uh, with a very nice story uh, about what ancient Anatolians ate. So what are proteins? Proteins are large macromolecules made up of long chains of amino acids. They carry out many different functions in our bodies. For example, they can be enzymes that catalyze chemical reactions. So you can think of these as the machines of the cell. They can provide structure to cells and tissues. So giving uh, muscles their shape, giving heart tissue its shape. Here they're acting as scaffolds. They're involved in copying DNA and growth, making more of ourselves, where our cells divide. They're involved in transporting important molecules, such as oxygen around the body. And also, rather pertinently, as many of us are receiving vaccines for coronavirus at the moment, proteins are antibodies, or rather antibodies are made up of proteins. And proteins uh, are very, very abundant in, in our bodies. So after water, they are the most abundant molecule. And 55% of the dry weight of an average cell or tissue equals a protein. So you may be wondering, how many different proteins does a human have? So how many different proteins have you got? So proteins are encoded by genes. So this is our genetic material, what we inherit from our parents. We have, or humans have, around 20,000 genes that can code for proteins. So if you think about it in this way, and, and assume that one gene equals one protein, then we have about 20,000 different proteins. But actually, we have uh, many, many more different types of proteins because of what happens to a protein once it's made. So what can happen in the body is that once our proteins are made, we then add different combinations of chemical entities to them. So uh, these chemical entities can be sugars, they can be lipids, and we add them to the proteins in different combinations. 
And it's now thought that after we've done this, we could have in each cell up to around 6 million different proteins or proteoforms. And uh, within a cell, there are many, many copies of each protein. In some cases, they may just be one or two copies. In some cases, there could be millions of copies of the same protein. So proteins are remarkably important. Now, as, as an aside, you're probably sat at home thinking very uh, proud thoughts about yourselves because you now know that you've got 20,000 genes. Well, just to uh, make this a little more sobering, here is a picture of a farmer, I'm assuming, holding a cabbage. He has got uh, 20,000 genes. The cabbage, however, has 40, almost 45,000 genes. So actually, the human genome, the, the number of genes that we have, and the proteins for which that codes, is actually very small at the side of uh, some other uh, organisms, particularly plants that tend to have um, a lot more genes. So what are proteins made up of? Proteins are made up of chains of amino acids. There are 20 naturally occurring amino acids, and I've done a nice wordle here with all their names. We can make many of them ourselves, but some of them we have to eat in our diet. So we call these essential amino acids, and I've listed the ones that we have to have or we can't make ourselves, and the only way we get them into our bodies is through our diet. It took a long time to discover all 20 amino acids, over 130 years. The first was the amino acid asparagine, and that was found uh, in asparagus. And a lot of the amino acids get their names from where they were found. So serine, the amino acid serine, gets its name from the Latin word for silk, serus, and uh, this is because serine was discovered in silk. Tyrosine gets its name for the Greek word for cheese, because that's where tyrosine was first uh, found. The last amino acid to be found was threonine. And that was, uh, is pretty new on the block, as it were, because it was discovered less than 100 years ago. But now we have a complete understanding of what the amino acids are that come together in chains to make proteins. So for those of you who uh, like chemistry, I thought I'd include a tiny bit of chemistry here. So uh, we have the structure of uh, a typical amino acid. So amino acids all have most of their structure in common, but each have a unique R group. So this group, uh, in the case of the simplest amino acid, is hydrogen, so that's for in glycine. And this R group for the second most simple amino acid, alanine, is uh, comprised of a carbon and three hydrogens. And serine, uh, it, for example, is comprised of a carbon, three hydrogens, uh, and, and an oxygen. So depending on what the R group is, gives the amino acid their property. So some amino acids are small, some amino acids are large, some are uh, very easily soluble in water, some of them are a lot more hydrophobic, so more difficult to dissolve in water. Some of them are acidic and some of them are basic. Now they all have a name, for example glycine, uh, but that's often abbreviated to a three-letter code, which is gly in the case of glycine. But scientists are remarkably lazy people, so generally we just give each amino acid uh, a letter. So in the case of glycine, that would be G. Now, many years ago, I made an amino acid jigsaw as, a, as an outreach exercise where um, I stood in the market square in Cambridge and gave out laminated amino acids to any, anybody who was passing who would take one off, off me. So I can't call, um, give, show you here all 20, but what I tried to do in this exercise was to give some information about the amino acid on one side, but then also the amino acids uh, view of life on the other side. So the three I've chosen are uh, glycine, which is the smallest amino acid, tryptophan, which is the largest, and glutamine, which is the most abundant. So in our bodies, we have more glutamine than any other amino acid. So how do they think about themselves? Well, glycine knows it's small and it's non-essential. You can make it. Tryptophan is an aromatic amino acid. It's a big amino acid and it's essential. That means that you can't make it and you have to eat it. Handily, with Easter coming up, you can find a lot of it in chocolate. So if anybody tells you off for eating far too much chocolate over Easter, you can just uh, tell them that you're topping up your tryptophan uh, concentrations. Glutamine is um, a polar amino acid. It's also non-essential. But if you're poorly, perhaps you might need to eat more of this to help you um, get better.
So I've already said that amino acids join together to form proteins. And I've got two amino acids here, valine and tyrosine, who are nicely holding hands together. Well, chemically, this hand holding is called a peptide bond. So two amino acids, we have one here and one here, will come together, and I'll explain in a moment how this happens in a cell, and they bind to one another to form what we call a dipeptide. So a dipeptide is uh, two amino acids. If you add another one, that's a tripeptide until you've built up an entire protein. So every protein has a unique um, sequence of amino acids. And these are coded by genes. So this is coded by our genetic material. So it's coded by DNA. And that is the heritable uh, molecule that we inherit from our parents. So each gene that codes for a protein has got a unique sequence of bases. And rather than the DNA itself being uh, decoded to make a protein, it goes through an intermediate. And the way that this happens, it's our, our DNA uh, in the cell, using a, a method called, or a process called transcription, is converted to a molecule called RNA. And each RNA molecule will, will carry this code. And uh, from this, in the process called translation, the code is decoded to form our protein. Now, this translation process happens at a very specialized machine within a cell called a ribosome. So a ribosome will look at the RNA sequence and from it decode uh, an amino acid at a time and join them together to make a protein. So the important message from this slide is that every protein has a unique sequence of amino acids and that is encoded by our genes, by our genetic material. So I mentioned uh, ribosomes. So this is uh, what one uh, looks like. This is a molecular structure of a ribosome. And it's important to say that many researchers uh, for many years have worked out the detailed structure of a ribosome. And in fact, three researchers, one of whom, Venki Ramakrishnan is from Cambridge, received the Nobel Prize in 2009 for having worked out this detailed structure. Now, for Science Day last year, that was sadly uh, cancelled, we converted the structure of a ribosome into a nice cartoon. We called this cartoon Robbie the Ribosome. And uh, what we're showing here is what Robbie actually does. So Robbie reads off the sequence in the RNA and converts that into protein sequence, which is uh, spewing out the top of uh, poor Robbie's head. So this is how ribosomes work. They read off the sequence and convert that into the sequence of our proteins. So proteins can be small or they can be large. The smallest proteins are just a few amino acids. So the example I want to give you is this one here. So this is the uh, nine amino acids which make up the protein bradykinin. And what bradykinin does is to promote inflammation in the body. So that's just nine amino acids long, but in a very, very specific sequence. So bradykinin, every molecule, every copy of the bradykinin protein has got the same sequence. Now, they're not linear, these sequences, and they uh, fold up to form quite intricate structures. We biologists like to portray them in all sorts of different ways, but the one I've shown here is um, a ribbon diagram. So this is a molecular structure of a different protein. This protein is called SUMO. And the, the, this linear chain can fold up to form helices. It can fold up to form more sheet-like structures, which gives the protein its overall structure. The way in which it folds up is dependent on the sequence of the amino acids. So some sequences will lend themselves to forming helices, while other sequences will lend themselves to forming more sheet-like structures. Um, of interest, one of the largest proteins in nature is a protein called titan which is a staggering 34,000 amino acids long. And you find this protein in your muscles. So it forms a, a spring-like structure, which helps muscle, muscles function. Another protein that you may well have heard of, which I've shown here as a molecular structure, is hemoglobin. So hemoglobin you find in your red blood cells. And in fact, it's an extremely abundant protein. If you were to dry down your red blood cells, 95% of it would be hemoglobin. 
its function is to carry oxygen around the body. And just to put in some sort of perspective how small proteins are, you can fit 10,000 hemoglobins um, across the width of a human hair. So proteins are tiny. So how do we identify them? I've told you that you've got at least 20,000 proteins and with added decoration, you might have 6 million. So how do you identify what these proteins are? How in the field of proteomics can we work out what the proteins are in our samples? Well, the quick and easy answer to this is we weigh them. Now, each of these amino acids has got a different weight. Now, that's not strictly true what I've just said, because two amino acids, leucine and isoleucine, have got the same amino, weight, amino acid weight as each other. But the rest of them are very different from one another. So arginine um, is 156, and I'll explain what the units of this are in a moment. Proline is 97, serine is 87, and so on and so forth. So if we go back to our uh, favourite protein, bradykinin, Bradykinin has got one serine, one glycine, two phenylalanines, three prolines and uh, two arginines. And if we add all these up, and we have to add water as well to this, then the uh, size of bradykinin is 1059. There is another protein which is related to bradykinin, but has a different sequence, a slightly different sequence. And if we add up all its constitutive parts, then the uh, weight of this different version of, of the protein is less. It's only uh, 1031. So each protein should have a, a unique mass. And that's how partly we can identify proteins by, by weighing them. So you may be asking yourself, well, you know, I'm taught that we, everything should have units. What are, is the unit of weight? Well, the unit of weight is the Dalton or the unified atomic mass. And the Dalton was named after this guy. This is John Dalton, who was a British chemist, physicist, meteorologist, did most of his work in the, in the city of Manchester. He lived a long time ago. But he was the first scientist to use the term atom for the smallest particle of matter. And a Dalton is one twelfth of the mass of a carbon. So this is how we define mass. So when I've said what well, all these masses are of bradykinin and related proteins, what I should have been saying is 1,031 Daltons. So this is what we want to do. We want to be able to weigh proteins to identify them. But how do we do it? Do we use a set of weighing scales? Certainly not. In fact, we can't use most of the, the different types of scales or weighing devices that we have in the lab. And this is because we're weighing extremely small amounts of material. So they wouldn't register on any of these devices. And what we have to use is one of these things here. And Reese has already uh, alluded to what this may be. This is a mass spectrometer. So a mass spectrometer can be thought of as a glorified and really rather expensive set of weighing scales. So one of these is going to set you back somewhere between half a million and a million pounds. So I'm not going to go into details about how mass spectrometers work. That would be the subject of a whole separate talk. But uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavour, what we do is to take our proteins and then using a particular device called uh, an ionisation source, we convert our proteins into gases in fact, into gaseous ions. These are then sucked into the mass spectrometer, and what the mass spectrometer then measures is its mass over charge. And all you really need to know is what the output of this is. So uh, this we call um, a mass spectrum. And a mass spectrum has got axes, so this is a graph if you like. Uh, the x-axis is the mass over charge, and the y-axis, so this one here, is the intensity. So each one of these lines is going to give us the mass of a different protein, because they're all different sizes. So this one here is giving us the mass of this protein. So I've just annotated what this line is. I've just um, written on what, what it is. So it's this, this protein here. And uh, by looking at this axis, we can get an idea of how much of this protein there is um, as well. So this is a mass spectrum. Each line uh, corresponds to a different weight which is a different protein. Okay, so 
What we could do is to get our mass spectrometer to, uh, in fact, I will go back a slide, get our mass spectrometer to just look at as many proteins in the sample as, as we possibly could. So we could take all our proteins and squirt them down the mass spectrometer and hope that we can get thousands and thousands of these different lines which will identify what our proteins are. Well, sadly, we can't do that because uh, big proteins will give very complicated patterns on our mass spectrum. So we need somehow to simplify this. And the way that we do it is to chop our proteins up into bite-sized chunks. Another reason for doing this is that many proteins may have exactly the same amino acids as each other, but not necessarily in the same order. So it is the sequence which is unique, not necessarily the amino acids that are used. So this reminds me, uh, for the uh, older members of the audience, of the fabulous uh, sketch in the 1970s from Morecambe and Wise. So you may remember Eric Morecambe sitting down attempting to play the first movement of Greek's piano concerto conducted by Andre Previn, and of course he made a real mess of it. Andre Previn got very angry with him because he was not a very good pianist, and to this Eric said, I'm playing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. So this is a bit the same here, that you could have all the same amino acids between two different proteins, but the uniqueness is the order in which they appear. So to work this out, what we do is to cut our proteins up into chunks. So imagine we have two proteins. We have the top one and we have the bottom one. They have the same amino acids. So they, each of them have both got a single arginine, a single phenylalanine, uh, two prolines, um, so the same amino acids, but they're not in the same order. And this is because they're not the same protein. It's not encoded by the same gene. So what we do is to chop them up. So here we are, chopping one up, chopping the other up. And depending how we chop them up, we end up uh, with uh, fragments, chunks, which we call peptides, which are then unique to that protein. So our first protein has got these three chunks and our second protein have got these three chunks and the size of the chunks is different. So we've made smaller peptides from our protein and uh, the way that we do this is to use proteases, not a pair of scissors, but proteases. Now proteases are proteins that chop up other proteins into bite-sized chunks. The one that we tend to use within the field of proteomics is, is the one here. This is a molecular structure of a protease called trypsin. You produce it from your pancreas. It's one of your digestive enzymes. We use it to chop um, proteins up in very precise ways. Other places that you may well have come across proteases are in washing powders uh, to get your clothes clean. The manufacturers will add proteases to washing powder, at least uh, biological washing powder. And another place that you will have come across proteases is pineapple and other fruits such as papaya. You often may have thought why when you eat pineapple you get a nice clean feel in your mouth afterwards. And this is because pineapple uh, produces a protease called bromelain. And it's also the reason why you can't make pineapple jelly very easily. Because if you add pineapple to jelly, the proteases within the pineapple will start to eat up the gelatin in the jelly and it won't set. So we're using proteases, in our case, a very specific protease called trypsin, to chop up our proteins. So back to how we can use this to identify proteins. Now, when we look at our mass spectrum, our mass spectrum now is of the peptides that are produced from each of our proteins after it's been chopped up. And each will give a very specific list of masses of uh, the molecules that the mass spectrometer is measuring and we can think of this as a fingerprint. So protein number one is giving this fingerprint here. Protein number two, which remember has got the same amino acids, but not necessarily in the same order, is giving this fingerprint here. And within uh, an experiment, we're gonna have thousands of these different fingerprints, which we feed into a computer. And what computer programs will do is to match each fingerprint to the theoretical fingerprints that are possible for every human protein. And out of it, we get a list of proteins in our sample. And in a typical experiment, we could identify somewhere between um, 5,000, and in some cases, if we're extremely careful, uh, 20,000 proteins per sample.
Actually, these days, what we do is to also work out the sequence of each peptide. But um, I don't have time to talk about this today. It would be a talk by itself. So this potentially could be a, a follow-up talk to come. All right. So I've now explained to you what proteins are, why they're important, um, how each protein has a unique sequence of amino acids, and how we can identify it when we can work out uh, the weight of, of uh, peptide chunks that we have made from each protein, which will be a characteristic fingerprint of that protein. So this is all very nice, but how can we use this to detect and treat disease? I've already talked to you about the fact that we can do this. So how, how on earth do we do it? So what we need to know is not only what proteins are present in a sample, but we also need to know the amounts. So different samples will have different amounts of proteins. So for example, if you're comparing um, liver tissue with brain tissue, they will have many, many proteins in common, but they'll have different amounts of each of them. Also, if we look at healthy tissue versus diseased tissue, may well be that they have all the same proteins, exactly the same proteins, but in different amounts. And if we can work out what those amounts are, then we may also have a fingerprint of the disease. So I just want to try and uh, drive this point home by showing you a very stylized cell. So here's a cell, it's a healthy cell. It's got loads of proteins, but we're just gonna pick out four that it's got. It's got many copies of the pink one, fewer copies of the yellow one, even fewer copies of the green one, and only one copy of the purple one. We have a diseased uh, cell over here, and it has many of the same proteins in common. It's missing the purple one, and it also now has a blue one. So if we can work out the proportions of these proteins between healthy and diseased cells, then if we found uh, a cell and we didn't really know what it was, if we can have a look at the proportions of these proteins, then we may be able to determine what that, whether the cell is diseased or not. So these would be markers for uh, a disease. We could also work out what new proteins are made or what proteins disappear to try and work out something about how the disease happens. So what, what causes the, the disease? And all this can be converted into mass spectra. So this is a mass spectrum from our uh, healthy sample. And we can see we've got loads of the pink protein, no blue protein and some purple protein. Our yellow protein is uh, not changed if we compare that with our disease sample. And we've got a different proportion of uh, the green and the purple protein, sorry, the green and the pink protein when we look at the mass spectrum for our uh, diseased cell. So on the diseased cell spectrum, less of the pink protein, more of the green, same amount of the yellow. We're now seeing the blue protein, but the purple proteins pretty much disappeared. So I've now explained to you uh, not only how we can measure proteins and weigh them to identify them, but also we can look at the amount of the protein. Just going back, because we've got this axis, which is intensity. So not only do we have our unique masses for our proteins or the peptides that we form from them, but we also can work out how much there is by looking at this axis on our mass spectrum to see what the changes in the amount of protein are between a healthy sample and a disease sample. So I'm now going to uh, finish up with three examples of how we use proteomics, so this protein weighing method, to answer some questions in biology and also in archaeology. So COVID-19, it's affected all of us. For the last year, we have had to uh, radically change uh, the way that we live and uh, there's no end to that change at the moment. Uh, there's vaccines, obviously, which are now available and hopefully life will get back to something like normal um, very soon. But when somebody is diagnosed with COVID-19, it's important to know how to treat them. When they test positive, some won't have any symptoms at all and some will have very varied symptoms from loss of taste, temperature, dry cough, feeling dizzy, all sorts of different uh, uh, symptoms, but they're often not in common. Some will need no medical intervention, they'll just be sent home uh, until they feel better. Some will need to be admitted into hospital and some will require um, medical support, uh, such as intensive care uh, and being ventilated. 
So a group of researchers, and I'm very um, proud to say that uh, myself and uh, group members were involved in this uh, project, tried to come up or have come up with a way of classifying how severe people with COVID-19's uh, disease is. So the thing to talk about to begin with is how the disease is, is classified. So the World Health Organization has come up with a scoring system. One and two are uh, people who have, may have mild symptoms, but they certainly don't require hospitalization. People who score three are hospitalized, but don't need oxygen. People who score four require oxygen, but this is gonna be by a mask or, or nasal prongs, all the way to school seven. And these are the extremely sick patients who will be requiring ventilation and additional organ support. So the questions that you would really like uh, the proteomics uh, approaches to answer is how severe is the illness? What's the trajectory? So if somebody turns up in hospital and a test positive, how bad is it going to get? Are they going to go as far as four? Are they going to go uh, as far as six? Very sadly, will they end up in this category of, of score seven? What treatment should be given immediately to, pre to prevent deterioration? And are there any new drugs that we can develop to treat the infection that we may find by looking at samples from the, the patients who end up scoring in the, the different categories? So what this study did, and these were researchers from um, all over Europe, led by a former colleague in the biochemistry department, Marcus Ralsa. Um, and what Marcus and, and his uh, colleagues did was to come up with a proteomics approach to weigh proteins, to work out which proteins are more or less abundant depending on the severity of COVID-19. Any method where there's going to be a lot of samples depending on that method needs to be cheap, it needs to be high throughput, so you need to be able to process many samples per day. And so this is what uh, Marcus did, or Marcus and his colleagues did, a, a, a quick, cheap uh, weighing method using the methods that we've described earlier, taking serum samples and plasma samples from patients. So the actual method was developed uh, using a, a cohort, a set of patients from Scotland who were healthy. And so that was just to work out a method by which you could measure proteins in um, proteins in uh, samples, uh, so a, a, a way to, to measure them um, quickly and easily. This method was then tested on 19 patients who were the first uh, to be admitted to uh, the Charité Hospital in, in Berlin, so Berlin Hospital. And then once the test had been developed, it was tested on a separate set of patients who came from Austria to confirm how good the test was. So. What um, the researchers found, and this I, I still think is, is quite extraordinary, is although plasma and serum samples, so blood samples from patients, contain thousands and thousands of different proteins, you only actually need to weigh 27 of them to categorize the patients. So by looking at the different amounts of these 27 proteins in plasma samples from the patients, you can work out whether they're category three, category four, and so on and so forth. These proteins are very important proteins, are involved uh, in coagulation, in inflammatory factors which are present in the blood. And actually, when the patients were, were looked at in uh, more detail, it was uh, found that, that two of them had been classified incorrectly. So two of them had been uh, classified by how they presented into one of these categories, but actually one of them didn't have coronavirus at all, at all though the patient had influenza, and the other patient was receiving chemotherapy and uh, their blood plasma proteins were affected by the chemotherapy, uh, which was confounding, made it seem as if they were, um, had severe COVID disease, where actually it was uh, influenced by the fact that they were also receiving medication for uh, the, uh, another, another disease. So since then, there's now been uh, another study this hasn't yet been published, um, it's a longitudinal study, where uh, what Marcus and his team hope to now find is prognostic markers uh, for disease uh, signatures. 
So the idea here is that as soon as a patient turns up, you can take the sample and work out using a variety of different markers, not just these 27 proteins, but other um, clinical measurements, how the disease is likely to progress. So now you know how to treat the patient. Is it a patient that's going to sadly end up in at seven? Is there something that you can do, therefore knowing that they're going on this trajectory to, to stop them getting there? So this is, is work in progress, but we hope that this will be published uh, in the next few months. So changing gear completely, I now want to go into the realms of crops and how the world can feed itself. Now, many of us like wheat. I like wheat a lot. I have toast for breakfast. I am one of the 50% uh, of the world's population that depends on wheat. The problem is that wheat is very um, sensitive and severely affected by drought. So with uh, changing climate, it's not going to be easy to predict really what we can expect of our wheat crops. There is another crop which is called pearl millet. And this is a very underutilised crop. And what is good about millet is that it will grow in hot, salty conditions. So if you could work out what made millet or what enables millet to grow in very severe uh, and extreme conditions, then we might understand uh, how we could engineer crops that we like to eat, such as wheat, to be able to exist in similar circumstances. So this work comes uh, from uh, a international set of researchers headed by a group in Vienna. And what they did was to look at the proteins. So they weighed the proteins, worked out the amounts of proteins uh, between our uh, millet, our pearl millet, and within wheat. What they noted was if you uh, water both millet and uh, wheat, then uh, the grain will there'll be very good grain yields. But in drought conditions, the pearl millet's grain yields are much less affected than, than in wheat. And by comparing the protein amounts in well-watered and drought conditions of both the millet and the wheat, what they found was that there's not much of an influence on the protein content, so the proteins that are identified and how much there is in millet compared with wheat. If you, uh, wheat um, is not well-watered, then this significantly impacts the proteins that are present and their abundance. Also, some varieties of millet stay green. This is called a stay green phenotype. And what that means is what the plants look like. So these millet plants will stay green even if you don't water them. So what they went on to do was to look at different varieties of millet. So one that would stay green and ones that won't stay green. And they did the protein weighing and the amounts of the proteins between the two. And what they noted was that in the stay green variety, they had increased amounts of certain proteins. Some of these were involved in photosynthesis. So that's the process that plants use to fix carbon and make food. And some of them were used to make, um, or some of them were proteins that make a protective wax. And you can understand uh, why that might be important in hot conditions because the wax will stop the plant losing water. So now what uh, the Viennese group and their colleagues have is a fingerprint of the stay green proteins. They know what proteins must be involved in, this, uh, in making these, uh, this variety of millet be resistant to drought and also stay green. Knowing this, then those, uh, this information can be used to engineer enhanced um, drought tolerance in crop plants that we actually want to eat, for example, wheat. So just finally, what else can we do? So this is proteomics crossing disciplines into the discipline of archaeology. And the work I want to describe comes from, um, again, a multinational team headed by people from the University of York and in Copenhagen. And this concerns an archaeological site which is thought to be um, around uh, 7,000 plus years old. And it's uh, in modern day Turkey. Um, so the country at that time or the area at that time we, we refer to as Anatolia. And the ancient Anatolians were the, the very early farming communities. And by excavating a site, what was found by archeologists was a whole load of ceramic pots. So the idea was, or the question was, well, what did they eat? And is there any evidence of proteins in these pots that have survived 
which will give some clues to what the ancient Anatolians ate. So, this isn't the first time that proteomics has been used in archaeology. But generally, for a protein to survive for uh, centuries, for thousands of years, it requires it to be in, in cold or very dry conditions, or in fact, waterlogged conditions. And this wasn't true for this site in Turkey. But what was very um, useful was that, like many of us, the ancient Anatolians must have suffered from hard water. So you all know if you live in an area with hard water and you don't filter it, that your kettle eventually will uh, fill up with white fur, so calcified deposits. Well, the ancient Anatolians had calcified deposits as, as well, and this was very, very useful to the modern day proteomics people because within those calcified deposits, the proteins had survived. Now, you might argue, um, and many people have done this, that rather than looking at protein, you can look at DNA that might remain um, in ancient samples, because DNA is a very robust molecule. But that doesn't really help us with trying to determine somebody's diet. You might find evidence for sheep DNA, but you don't know if the ancient Anatolians were drinking sheep milk or if they were tucking into roast lamb every Sunday. So by looking at proteins, we can work out at what sort of sample the proteins must have come from. So was it milk? Was it uh, muscle? So meat that they would eat? So having a look at what they did eat, it seems to me that they had a very healthy diet. So in terms of vegetables, there was evidence for wheat and barley, vetch, which is very common in that part of Turkey, and peas and beans. Looking at what dairy products they could find evidence for, it was uh, obvious that they ate, they drank sheep's milk and goat's milk, but they could even work out the ratio. So there's six times as much deposit from sheep than there was from goats. So they clearly like sheep milk more than they like goat's milk, or perhaps they had more access to sheep than they did to goats. They also had cow's milk, but interestingly, that always appeared in a separate pot. And there was evidence, and we know this from the, the proteins that they found, that they separated curds and whey in the same way that we do. So maybe that thousands of years ago, uh, the ancient Anatolians were uh, eating yogurts. In terms of what animal products they were, what uh, meat products they, that we could, uh, or they could find, there was evidence of, of blood products on the uh, inside, which could have come from, uh, from meat that they were eating. But also they were able to see outside of the, um, the pots actually scraping off the surface of, of the ceramic that they were likely to use um, horse and goat blood uh, in, in decoration. So this, they were painted their pots and they were using blood to do this. Interestingly, there was no sign of other com common foodstuffs like fruits and berries. And this, uh, they believe, is because what they, were found, what they found were cooking pots and storage pots. And they weren't cooking fruits and berries or storing them for any length of time. Presumably, they weren't, these were held in um, or put on, on other sorts of ceramics, but certainly not in these storage pots. So just by looking at what proteins are present, the researchers really were, were, were looking at master chef for ancient Anatolians, that they could work out what their diet was likely uh, to comprise of, and also some of the, uh, the, the, the cooking practices from uh, thousands of years ago. So with that, I will end. I hope you can see why weighing proteins is so important. I've given you three very different examples of, of how proteomics can be used in disease, in improving crops, and also in uh, working out uh, the lifestyles of ancient civilizations. So thank you very much, and I will answer any questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was that was genuinely fascinating, and it's amazing to see such diverse applications for the mass spectrometry. That, that was great. Um, uh, just a technical thing, Latika, could you turn my webcam back on, please? You've turned it off, so I don't have the ability to turn it oh, back on. Oh, my apologies. Uh, there we go. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so we're now going to have uh, the question and answer session. So if you have any questions, if you could post these in the live chat on YouTube, and then we'll answer as many of these as we can get through for you. And there is a 20 second delay though between what we're saying on Zoom and you hearing us on YouTube. So uh, that means I get to ask the first question. And um, so I think the, the biggest question, uh, Catherine, was the Marmite proteome. 
why? <laughs> she wasn't allowed to tell us anything about this. This was a project we had with the um, chemical engineering department. And what they were interested in is the fact that Marmite has very um, different viscous properties to any other liquid. That was the hypothesis, that, that it has its, its own um, way of flowing as a, as a, a semi-liquid. And they were wondering if what the proportions of proteins were within Marmite that might answer the question of why it had these properties. So that's what the, the project. Okay. So um, they weren't and looking at whether it was something that you love or hate in that case. No, no. You, know, you didn't have the love, the love proteome or the hate proteome. <laughs> that would be very useful for uh, the manufacturers of uh, yeast-based <laughs> yeast products, I suppose. Mm. But I no, gotta say, I'm very indifferent to the product. I, I, I'm neither on the love or hate side, so maybe I'm weird. <laughs> I'm definitely on the hate side. <laughs> and presumably then this would be so they could make new materials that mimic that viscous property. Yes, I mean, it, um, the project um, didn't extend for any, any length of time. I mean, what Marmite is made from is yeast. So the yeast protein, all the proteins that you would expect in yeast dominated um, what, what we saw. Hmm. I guess uh, it's actually, Following on from what Latika said about being able to distinguish between the, the love group and the hate group, um, I have a, a vaguely related question. Um, so you mentioned about the protein proportions um, that can be detected by mass spec in diseased tissue versus healthy tissue. So is mass spectrometry used in disease diagnosis or prognosis and perhaps for diseases like cancer? Um, yes, it... it certainly has been. I think um, it's still on a trajectory to be used more as a diagnostic tool. Uh, more latterly, it's used as a um, investigative tool. So what's the differences between healthy tissue and not healthy tissue? And if it's, for example, taking what Marcus found in his project where there's only 27 proteins, they only need to measure 27 proteins to be absolutely discriminatory between people who end up in these, these different um, World Health Organization categories, then the same is probably true for many other diseases. And if you know what the protein changes are, then when you get patient samples in, you don't want to measure the entire proteome because you don't need to. So what you would do then is to create assays where you're just measuring a few proteins, and these will be much quicker assays and uh, the key is to get them that are discriminatory enough that you know when somebody turns up that they have got um, a particular disease rather than having started with a nasty cold that day. Yeah. And actually, uh, you mentioned uh, Marcus's uh, and yours COVID study. Um, what are the next steps? Could you explain what a longitudinal study is? That's that yeah, a longitudinal, I should have explained this in more detail, but I was running out of time a bit. A longitudinal study is where you follow a patient. I mean, not follow physically, but follow the patient by <laughs> taking samples um, every, every day or so. And then you can see how, that prote how the, the proteins change as that patient starts to develop more symptoms, perhaps has more need for oxygen or recovers. So that's what, what a longitudinal study is, is rather than taking one sample and that telling you everything you need to know about the patient, you take samples um, at time intervals and that tells you how the patient's, um, how the, the disease is progressing and how you, that mirrors the amounts of, and of proteins that are in plasma, for example. Plasma is the easiest of the uh, samples to, to get, obviously, that, we all know that have had our uh, COVID tests sticking something down the back of your throat makes you cough violently and nobody really wants that. Blood samples are not, are not nice to take, but they're perhaps easier and more controlled in the way that we can take them. Yeah. And um, this is a bit of a jump, but this is quite a, an interesting question from YouTube. So uh, are there opportunities to go back over previous archeological finds and do new protein analysis to discover additional information? Um, yes, and there are a great many groups um, 
around the world who are now doing this, including groups in Cambridge. Um, for example, um, a, a group in the archaeology department here are interested in old parchments and manuscripts to see what people used as inks or what they used to make those manuscripts. The key for all of this is how the samples were collected. So if you know what you are doing, I mean, you know what you're doing, if you think that the samples could be used uh, in this way, then you've got to be really careful that you don't contaminate them with yourself and what you ate for, for lunch. So if an archaeologist tucks into a cheese sandwich and then starts fishing out bits of ceramic pot, covers them in their cheese sandwich encrusted hands, then the proteome is going to be the cheese sandwich proteome. What it's not going to be is the, the proteome of the ancient civilization. So it's always very, very important to be careful how you take the samples and that you don't contaminate them with uh, the modern world. And I think this was what was so good about the example that I gave you from the, the Danish York group is that what they were looking at were protein remains within these calcified deposits. So it's within the deposit and nothing which could be easily contaminated by modern day life. Mentioning the, the cheese sandwich actually, so as scientists we can't just rule something out because it seems unusual. So how would you, if you ended up with cheese sandwich in your results, how would you know that that was contamination and that they didn't actually use cheese sandwiches in their <laughs> building materials or in their... Uh, very difficult. I mean, a way that you could do it uh, would be to um, choose a piece of material, modern material, that you sort of sit in the same position uh, for a while and then try and sample it in the same way. Um, and see what they, I mean, there was always uh, natural contaminants. Every proteomic sample, so every sample that you weigh in a mass spectrometer and you, you analyze, you will always get some of the person who did the experiment in there too. And that's because however careful we are, the most common protein um, about us is keratin, so skin and, and hair, and it's in dust, it's in everything. So we will always see keratin, but it's, it's not the keratin, we'll always uh, identify the protein keratin and we'll measure how much there is. But it's not necessarily come from the sample that we're interested in. It's come from the person who did the experiment. It used to be quite interesting um, in my lab uh, when it got to winter time and you'd see more sheep keratin. And that's because people were coming to work in woolly jumpers. You also got to know which members of the lab had cats and dogs who so they'd struck <laughs> immediately before coming to work because you see cat keratin and, and dog keratin in there. So you can actually find out a lot about your colleagues by looking at their samples and uh, what they're contaminated with. We won't ask you if you've found anything particularly interesting. On <laughs> no, I wouldn't <laughs> answer even if you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's another interesting question here. Um, so you mentioned protein folding. Uh, do some proteins fold in different ways? And if so, does that affect your ability to identify them by mass spec? That's a very good question. And uh, some forms of mass spectrometry, which I haven't described, can actually give um, information about how proteins are folding. Uh, proteins will fold uniquely. So protein folding is determined by amino acid structure. And as all proteins have got different amino acid structure, they're, they're sorry, different amino acid sequences, how they fold will be slightly different. I mean, some of them will be grossly the same, but there'll be slight differences depending on, on what, what the protein is. Uh, in our case, we do terrible things to the protein as part of our experiments. So the first thing we do is to uh, unfold them. So if they're all sort of screwed up like this, we add detergents and all sorts of other things. So they're nice linear structures. So they're now long strings and all the folding has disappeared. And the reason we do that is because we want our proteases, so our pineapple bits or our trypsin or whatever, to be able to effectively chop up the protein into chunks that we can then measure. If the protein's still folded up, the proteases can't get in there and, to, and do their job. So for proteomics, uh, or the, the um, type of proteomics that I've just described, we get rid of all the structure by adding 
detergents and other chemicals which will unfold the proteins. And staying on the theme of like the fundamentals of uh, mass spec, uh, you mentioned that uh, leucine and isoleucine have the same mass. Mm -hmm. I think it was those two. Uh, is there any way to distinguish between them in mass spec? So how would the you only that? way, n not that we, um, in, most of, in our, the way that we do experiments, we just say either or. Um, you can, because the chemical structures, it's a bit, it's sort of the same back to Eric Morecambe. It's the same number of atoms, but in a slightly different order. So if that R group, so the, 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 the bit that hangs off the amino acid, which makes it unique, if we can chop that up in an experiment, then you can actually tell the difference between leucine and isoleucine. But we don't tend to bother. We don't really need to know the difference between the two. If, yeah. um, it, it's either or. So in all our um, experiments and all the, informa all the computer work that we do at the end of it, you just say either or for like isoleucine and, and leucine. Cool. Uh, Latika, do you have anything you wanted to ask or to add? Um, kind of going back onto the whole pineapples thing. So <laughs> I have, I just can't uh, sort of moderate the food I eat. So I'll end up eating like maybe three pineapples worth. Okay, that's an exaggeration there, but too much. And obviously you start to get that horrible sort of cut up feeling on your tongue. Is that due to the proteases? Because I feel like most people uh, attribute that to it being a, an acidic fruit. I think it will be a combination. I don't know for sure, because I've never really researched the pineapple. Uh, one sat at home for me to eat tonight, yeah. to celebrate having done this talk. But uh, <laughs> I think it would depend whether the protease bromelain is, um, still works in the mouth. So the mouth is a particular pH, a particular level of acidity um, or basicity. And it may be that the bromelain isn't particularly active, but I, I don't know, to be honest, but it could well be. Yeah, something that I could probably research from them. <laughs> yeah. An interesting follow-up for a future talk, either <laughs> from Catherine or from Latika. <laughs> uh, I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, so this one comes from YouTube again. Uh, so do you see a method coming along where fragmentation of the proteins isn't necessary? Kind of like the Oxford nanopore minion, min ion for protein mm -hmm. sequences. I believe that um, nanopores are being investigated for their use with proteins. So the idea there is that you have a little pore and you suck an amino acid through at a time and each amino acid would give a different electric signal. And so you would be able to just read off a sequence. So depending on what the signal was, it could be a serine signal, a glycine signal, a tryptophan signal and so on and so forth. Um, so I believe that this is work in progress um, and it's something which we are very much looking forward to because it would be a great complementary method to mass spectrometry. Hmm. And a good note to end this session on, I think. Uh, so uh, I just want to say thank you very much, Catherine, for a fantastic talk. And it's, like I said, it's great to see such diverse applications for this uh, fundamental technique that you and the Cambridge Centre of Proteomics are working on. So thank you very much for the talk. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much also Latika. Thank you very much also Latika for helping me out behind the scenes again. No problem. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone at home or in your gardens for watching this talk. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you again either tomorrow or Thursday for the rest of the talks that we have coming up for the Cambridge Festival. So have a lovely evening, stay safe, and we'll see you again soon. Cool. Bye. Bye.